is Bill Fleming reporting from Indianapolis. Today was one of the busiest in the long history of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. A record number of cars have qualified on this first official day of qualifying for the Indy 500. 30 cars have made the field with three spots open for that race coming up a week from tomorrow, the 67th annual Indy 500. In addition to the sheer numbers of cars that were qualified, there were a number of surprises today. The biggest, perhaps, was that for the first time in 33 years, a rookie has won the pole position as the fastest qualifier. Teo Fabi, an Italian road racer, in his first trip to Indy, set a four-lap record of 207.395 and an all-time one-lap mark of 208.049 miles an hour. When Walt Faulkner sat on the pole in 1950, he was a rookie, and he qualified at 134 miles an hour, which at that time was a new record. By the way, he went on and finished seventh in the race. Now let's quickly run down the drivers who have qualified for uh, the race so far. Tail Fabi, Mike Mosley, and Rick Mears, the 79 winner in the first row. In row two, Tom Sneva, a three-time second-place finisher who's never won it. Then Al Unser Jr. beat out his daddy. He qualified faster. He's in the second row. Bobby Rahal next to him. Then in the third row, three-time winner Al Unser Sr., Roger Mears, the older brother of Rick and Tony Bettenhausen. In row four, Gordon Johncock, last year's winner, and he'd won it once before. Mario Andretti, the 69 winner, and Howdy Holmes. In row five, George Snyder, a veteran of 18 500s, then Pancho Carter and Bill Whittington. In row six, Chip Ganassi, Pat Bedard, and Jose Legarza. In the seventh row, a rookie Steve Chassis, he's one of six, by the way, the veteran Dick Simon. And then Danny on Gaius, and look at that, 202 320. That was the fifth fastest qualifying speed, but because of his position in the uh, qualifying, he did not get up in the fifth position. He is 21st. Kevin Cogan hoping to make up for the accident that he triggered last year. Had a nice qualifying speed. A.J. Foyt right in there and Chris Kneifel. In row nine, Jeff Brabham, Don Whittington, and Derek Daly. And in the tenth row, Scott Brayton, Chet Phillips, and Johnny Mailer, the veteran. And, of course, anybody's guest who will fill out the remaining three spots. So that's the way the field shapes up. We'll get a comment from Sam Posey about what he thinks will happen tomorrow in just a moment. Well, it's been a busy day, as I mentioned, so Sam, what do you think about it? Bill, the, shape, the grid shapes up in a very interesting way. It's kind of an accordion-like quality to it, with very fast cars at the front, slow cars in the middle, fast cars again at the back. And there's a very big speed differential, 27 miles an hour as it sits right now, which is a new record. It used to be, I think, 16 or 17 miles an hour. So it bodes, frankly, to me, that it could be a dangerous start in the race. I don't like the look of it. Well, the, the bubble show, of course, comes off tomorrow. We'll be here for the six hours of qualifying. Hope you'll join us then. We should mention that the official protests have been withdrawn by A.J. Foyt and nine other drivers. So no more controversy. Bill Fleming, along with Sam Posey and Chris Economist. And this is Jackie Stewart. The Indianapolis Motor Speedway, where earlier this afternoon at 4.15, we had a dramatic happening. We've had difficult weather all day. But at that time, Dennis Firestone in car number 90 got onto the racetrack for an attempt to qualify. Rain crowds were certainly threatening as he went round on this, the third lap of his qualifying attempt. He had previously tried to qualify on two occasions, calling off at 186 miles an hour, calling off also at 191 miles an hour. And this was his last, his third attempt, not allowing himself to get into the race other than this attempt here, trying to burst the bubble for a man who had already qualified at a relatively slow speed, 180 miles an hour, John Mailer, who was obviously standing on the sideline. As he comes up to take the white flag, which means one lap to go around this two and a half mile super speedway at Indianapolis, a 33 car field, this was to get him into that 33 car field. The clouds were really beginning to, and you can see how close he was to the wall there as he came out of turn one through turn two at this time and getting onto the back stretch. Now, the rain clouds were really threatening. He could obviously see that from his driving position, and remember, these cars have got slick tires, there's no drainage for the wet weather, and he goes in now to turn three where spots of rain apparently were already hitting the car. He had reduced his speed considerably. Remember, he had to beat 180 miles an hour. It looked like he had an easy time, but he could at this time so simply have gone off the racetrack. So Dennis Firestone, a road racer, born in Australia, president of a trucking company, was 
seeing that checkered flight in sight, he was able to cross the finishing line and therefore qualify for the 67th running of the Indianapolis 500. As the rain came down, Chris Economaki was down in the pits waiting for Dennis Firestone to come in. A jubilant Dennis Firestone. Here he is. Hey, congratulations, Dennis. Hey, I, can't, I can't believe it happened. <laughs> you had a big slowdown on the last stop, obviously because of the rain. Well, it started pouring on me down the back straightaway and going into turn three. I said, oh, my God, i got to get through this lap somehow. What were those last corners like? Oh, those last corners are real slippery. Well, did you, did you know it was going to rain when you went out? Oh, it looked like it was pretty clear it was going to happen. We just didn't know when. Well, okay, good luck to you. A lot of drama here. Thank you very much. You sure was. We can move in now. Dennis is happy, but Bill Alsop was waiting in line when this rain came on. Bill Fleming was down in the pits in that rainstorm talking to him. Bill, Mother Nature has played a very cruel trick on you. <laughs> well, you know, we got ready here, and uh, I guess we just got snookered by five or so minutes. Pretty close. Well, that's just right. Last year, you also had uh, similar problems. Well, yeah, this year we're on the upswing, though. Last year, I think we, we battled all month and really didn't get anywhere. This year, we've got a new car, and uh, just uh, my crew has, has been given it their all, and uh, I think we're, we're on the way up, but uh, this might be a little bit of a setback. Do you think you can run faster than the uh, car you have to bump right now, which is about 183 miles an hour? Oh, yeah, we're running right at uh, 87, 88. Of course, this water will, will, you know, make the track green again, and uh, generally that what that does is put a push back in the car. So, I um, uh, don't know, we'll see, but we definitely were, before the rain, uh, running a good competitive speed. Well, the forecast is no more rain, but the question is, can they drive the track out in time? I know you'll be anxiously watching. <laughs> we sure will. Thanks. ABC Sports Exclusive is being brought to you by Lowenbrow. When you want the taste of a truly great beer, there's really only one. So now we're live at Indianapolis. A shot of downtown Indianapolis from this motor speedway. The weather conditions, to say the least, have been turbulent. We had dry conditions earlier. We had a, thund a thunderstorm of considerable proportions. It then dried out, and we then had another little shower. So therefore, the track at the present time is certainly too wet to allow any cars on the racetrack and certainly at the moment no more qualifying. You can see the trucks going around the track attempting to dry it. It is quite warm here so we could easily, within about 55 minutes, see a car attempting to qualify and Bill Ossop still in line for that. Certainly the month of May has been a changeable month for weather. It has nevertheless been a spectacular month. We've had some of the best motor racing we've ever seen here. And to report this, it's Jackie Stewart, and sitting alongside me here, my colleague Sam Posey, it has, in fact, been a, a spectacular month, Sam. It has, and the weather has been so capricious throughout the month. It's interesting that it would play another trump card right at this point at the end. Jackie, no one expected this shower, and it has thrown absolutely into a cocked hat the expectations of the teams that were waiting to try to qualify. Nevertheless, it has been the fastest month of May that we've ever seen. We have a qualifying average for the entire field of more than 198 miles an hour, a new record. We've had records broken in every division in a way because we had a one-lap record yesterday by a young Italian called Tio Fabi who set the heather on fire to say the least. He not only broke the one-lap record, he also broke the four-lap record getting onto the pole position at over 207 miles an hour. It's also been a month, Sam, where there have been accidents. It has, Jackie, and as we sit here, there are four men in the hospital as a result of injuries uh, from crashing into the wall this year. And I think the reasons for this have been, first, the very high turn speeds uh, that have been caused by the enormous increase in the sophistication of the design of the cars. Uh, secondly, the drivers have actually approached the turns differently on a higher line than before, and it's meant that the angle of incidence when they hit the wall has been sharper than before. Lastly, the drivers are sitting further forward in the cars because of design changes to the cars, and when they hit, the, their feet and legs have taken the punishment. So it's been a brutal month for the drivers. Well, later on in this show, hopefully, we're going to see some more qualifying. As I say, the track could easily dry out. If that's the case, we'll explain the, the problems of bumping and how the bubble works. So, therefore, we can still look forward to that. 
Bill Ossoff is still glued to his car there. That's live, and he's sitting in his car right now waiting for the sun to come out and bake dry this racetrack, which could be enormously important for him to try and attempt to make this 33-car field that's already there. We're going to have an interview with the man on pole position, Theo Fabi, in just a few moments. Right now, we'll leave Indianapolis, and we'll come back and join Theo Fabi in just a few minutes. What you're looking at now is live from Indianapolis. This is a track dryer, a turbine that goes out there to try and put hot air on the racetrack to try and dry it out. You see two of them there going along this main front stretch here. Every attempt is being made to dry the track out so that we can continue with qualifying. And as I look at my watch now, it's about 50 minutes to go before the gun goes off. And that means the end of qualifying. Now, as I said, it, it has been a very exciting month of May. Incredible speeds have been achieved. It hasn't been an easy month, however. Weather has played a, an ever-important part here at Indianapolis. It seems every year it brings new problems. However, as I said, it has been exciting. Great speed has been achieved. And over the last week particularly, it has been important. Let's take a look back at this point on what's been happening so far in qualifying. The Indianapolis Motor Speedway last weekend was wet and miserable. No cars got out to qualify, which was sad for all the drivers and even sadder perhaps for the spectators because the month of May here in Indianapolis has been wet and miserable. But yesterday dawned much better, a dry track. And in fact, on the first occasion in the history of this speedway, 33 cars qualified. The fastest man right here, if you look at it, was Mike Mosley. He went out first and got the pole at that time. Chris Economaki spoke to him about that. Mike, will your speed hold up for the pole? Well, it's hard telling, Chris. I would like to have gone faster. Like I said earlier, I had a wide open all the way around. That's what as fast as we go. I would most definitely love to sit on the pole. I'd love to sit in the front row, but I'd love to sit on the pole. The sixth car out was a remarkable young man, Al Unser Jr., a rookie here. He qualified at a speed of 202 miles per hour. The son of Al Unser Sr., Chris Economaki had the opportunity to ask Big Al what he thought about his son racing in the 500. Do you worry at all about being in the race with your son? I don't think so, Chris, because of the talent that the boy has. Uh, I, don't, I don't even give it any mind whatsoever because he's a sharp lad. Isn't it remarkable that he, in fact, was out-qualified by Junior? Now, Rick Mears did this, brushes the wall there. An incredibly heroic effort to try and secure pole position was just not good enough. He did, however, get it on the front row of the starting grid at 204 miles an hour. Then this young man, 27 years of age, Theo Fabi, a rookie at Indianapolis, created new records, a one-lap qualifying record and a four-lap qualifying record. Quite a remarkable performance by a man who's just arrived in America from road racing in Europe. From Italy, Theo Fabi. And then, as ever, the center of attention at Indianapolis, A.J. Foyt. A.J., with nine other drivers, ran into technical complications with the technical committee, and his car lined up, along with the others, was sent back to the end of the lineup, therefore not allowing him to qualify for pole position. At this time, he was talked to by Tom Bin for the Chief Steward, but A.J. Foyt was allowed to continue, did qualify at 199 miles an hour, and got himself into the eighth row of the starting grid. So the great A.J. will start his 26-500. A great day of records, the first time in the history where all 33 cars qualified in one day. The fastest field ever for this great race. Indeed, a fabulous month of speed. The average so far for the entire field of 33 cars is more than 198 miles an hour. And, of course, that's another new record. A man who contributed a great deal to raising that new record is sitting beside me right now, and that's Teo Fabi. Now, Teo, you've arrived here in Indianapolis. You've come from Italy. It's a brand new experience for you to go around a super speedway of any kind, nevertheless, one doing 207 miles an hour average. How have you managed to achieve that in such a short time? Well, you know, better than me, when you drive a nice handling car, everything is very easy. But surely Indianapolis must be awe-inspiring for you. I, I remember when I first came to Indianapolis, the drama of seeing these enormous grandstands and the, 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 the ultimate speed, that until then I had never had that sort of experience of speed, and I dare say you haven't either. 
Yes, it was very difficult the first uh, few days to go up with the speed. And uh, because it's so fast a circuit, I think it's very dangerous. So I try to go up with the speed very slowly and try to be comfortable. Now, after road racing, where you're not in close proximity to the outside wall, for example, do you, do you find this threatening? No, really. I don't think it makes any difference to, to have the wall just outside the track or two meters. Well, now, last year we, we had a, another problem, and I, I would attract your attention to that. We had on the front row of the starting grid, Kevin Colgan, who, who sadly got in a tangle right at the very beginning, before they ever reached the start line almost. Now, he was a rookie. Now, obviously, a great many people are going to be looking at you and saying, he, uh, he didn't have much experience before coming here, and he's on the pole. Well, you know, I think the start is the most dangerous moment in a, in a race, but uh, I prefer to be at the front. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, of course, Kevin Cogan wasn't actually a rookie. He was new to the sport as being so close and such a, a fast-running car at that time, but nevertheless very off-putting. How do you account for the difference between road racing. Now, you struggled hard in road racing to, to get a foothold in Europe. You haven't got yourself into a, a good seat in a Formula One car, and yet suddenly you arrive in, in the new world in America, and here you are a king overnight almost. Well, you know, I have a very good relation with uh, Robin Hurd, who designed my car, and uh, he fixed this drive for me. So I was lucky to come in so good team for the first experience. What about the race? You've practiced very fast, you've qualified extremely fast. Is the race going to be different for you, more difficult? Well, for sure, it's a very long race. Uh, I think it's very difficult to, to keep the concentration for three hours. Uh, I don't know, I, I just hope to lead, to lead the last lap and uh, to follow the leader for the rest. <laughs> Well, let's hope that for you. A tremendous achievement, nevertheless. Many congratulations to you, to, to Tio Fabi, to the fastest man around this speedway ever as an average speed and a one-lap record. We'll be uh, coming back to you very soon when you come back to the man who's got the slowest speed, the man who's on the bubble right now, who's the most vulnerable to lose his position for this year's 500. We'll be back. As you can see from this live picture from the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, all the wrecker trucks are driving around the racetrack trying to dry it out, and it is drying, I might add. You can see the gas turbines there blowing hot air onto the racetrack in the front stretch here. Enormously powerful and noisy machines, nevertheless, they do a very good job. And they're on the groove right now where the race cars would drive round. I suppose that that particular part at probably around 210 miles an hour. The other trucks there attempting to dry the wettest part of the racetrack blowing some of that dampness out into the place where they might be able to catch the sun. The crowd already thinning, however, in the hospitality suites and the exit of Turn 2, but you can see there from the racetrack that it's becoming quite dry now. We're fairly optimistic that, in fact, we'll be able to get some qualifying done before we go off the air at 6 o'clock. And, of course, it's a very important hour, this final hour. The bubble show, it's sometimes called, and the reason for that is that the slowest man in the 33-car field is in jeopardy in this final hour. If any of the cars in the lineup attempt to qualify, and hopefully they will, and they go faster than the average speed of the man in the bubble, that is to say the slowest car on the racetrack, which at this time is a driver called, called Chet Phillips, his average speed at the present time is 183.146 miles an hour as an average for his four laps. If anybody goes faster than that, he gets bumped out of the field. A very nerve-wracking affair. Now, down in the pits, we have Chris Economaki with the man on the bubble right now, Chet Phillip. Down to Chris. I'm with 27-year-old Chet Phillip, a Texan who has been on a horse only once in his life. They may disown you, Chet, but you're bone dry and I'm soaking wet. Where were you when Dennis Firestone ran into the rain? Well, all day, uh, my wife and the owner and his wife have been hid out in an apartment, wearing the knobs out on the radios and TVs, trying to hear what's going on. We are too nervous to come out here, so we've just been trying to get what we could at the, at the apartment. What happened when you saw the rain fall? What was going through your mind? Well, all day long, I just figured there wasn't any hope, and, and, uh, but I just didn't predict 
the weather, I guess, and it just I just couldn't believe there was any hope until the, the rain hit. Uh, Chet, there's about uh, 38 minutes left before the track closes, and then it's 500-mile race time. What do you think looking at that bright sun? Are you safe, or are you still in trouble? Well, in West Texas, the sun like that dried out in a hurry, but I don't know what it'll, it'll do here, so i still got my fingers crossed. Well, uh, <clears throat> I'm sure that you'll stay in. Uh, uh, the, the track is pretty wet. How will you celebrate making the race? Well, probably just go out to eat and just think about, you know, doing a lot better in the race than we did in the time trials. You're concerned about your slow speeds. Why Why is your car slower than uh, the norm? Well, it's just the day before qualifying, the day before yes, or yesterday was the only time we could run the car. And we put in like 250 miles in one day, but it still just wasn't enough. And, and we're just going to have to find some more speed and just work on that on the carburation day. Okay, oh, good luck to you, Chet Phillip, and back to you, Jackie. Well, Chet Phillip, obviously hoping for rain, a man who's not hoping and who's clock watching right now is Bill Holsop. He's certainly paying attention to the watch, and of course he's hoping this track will dry and therefore be able to get out and make an attempt to qualify. He has attempted one time and called it off, and you can see how wet it still is as that brush clears some of that uh, wet surface away there. Uh, as I said, Bill Alsop's already attempted to qualify, called it off at about 189 miles an hour. Now, as ever, much is talked about in the respect to rookies, and we met one just a few moments ago, the man who's on the pole, a rookie, was Theo Fabi from Italy. Now, what do rookies have to go through to qualify to run in this speedway? We have a rookie orientation piece that we've been able to tape here to give you some idea what they've got to do. My colleague here, Sam Posey, was able to explain it through for us. This is the way Gasoline Alley looked back in early April. Bleak and deserted, the raucous excitement of May still a long way off. But there was tension here nonetheless. For three days, the track was to be open to this year's rookie drivers who would participate in a specially supervised program. First came the formalities. Here's Al Unser Jr. as he approached the registration office. Entry forms and insurance waivers were completed in an atmosphere of friendly welcome. A sharp contrast to the days not so long ago when tradition seemed to demand that a rookie's life here be made as hard as possible. Behind the change is former driver Roger McCluskey, the amiable and intelligent drill sergeant of the new rookie boot camp. With the help of a track diagram and several other veteran drivers, Roger explains the problems a first-time driver will face. Come in in the hot lane, and as your speed comes down, start dropping it over in the left lane, down into your pit. Roger, in May, unless a guy's running 190 mile an hour or quicker, they might not even want to, they might want to start pulling down a little bit earlier than coming right off the wall. Because if somebody's set up to go underneath you, coming off floor, that's what happened to Danny Young Guy a few years ago here. Somebody pulled right in front of him as he dropped down to pass him on the inside. And he hit the wall a ton. From the classroom, it's onto the track. Here, rookie Chris Kneipel, driving, is shown the way around by veteran Lee Kunzman. Going this way, you'll get into turn one a little faster than you want. You'll have a tendency to, you think you want to enter too low. Right. What'll happen getting into turn three, when the wind is this direction, it'll pin the front end a little tighter. So it'll be a little bit... Just a shade loose getting in. Finally, the moment no driver ever forgets, his first laps on the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. A plus he puts a limit on the speeds allowed, a strategy which protects the driver from having to try to impress his sponsors in the press before he's really ready. The class of 83, we wish them well. Well, you can see from this live picture from the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, the sun has come out. It's certainly drying. You can see the shadows from the trucks there. You can see the shadows from our dryer itself. Let's go down to the pits and meet our colleague, Bill Fleming. Jackie, yes. thank you very much. I'm standing with Dwayne Sweeney, who is the official starter of the race. He's the man who is up there on that little catwalk who gives the green flag, the yellow flag, the other flags, and most importantly, the checkered flag. Dwayne, you've been here a long time. You've seen the track many, many years. In your estimation, what, 34 minutes? Do you think they can dry it out in time? It's going to be very close, Bill. They've got every bit of piece of equipment they've got here out there trying to get it in shape. We've got to do our very best to help these guys out. Now, they tell me that uh, the backstretch is fine because you see it doesn't have an overhang from that front grandstand. Now, you've been in contact with Tom Binford, the chief steward who is going around in the uh, safety car. 
What's his, uh, have you heard any conversation? No, they're not really putting out a lot of word. They're, all they're telling us, we're working on it. We're working on it. Okay. Dwayne, uh, everybody envies you on, on race day. You'll be the most popular guy in the world for one driver. That's when you give him the checkered flag. That's right. <laughs> the rest of them have no use for me. Okay. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. I want to move over here and talk uh, once again to Bill also. Billy, I just checked my watch. It looks like about 31 minutes. Uh, that must be torture for you sitting there. Well, mine says 527. You want to want to arm wrestle for the difference? <laughs> I hope you're right. I'll give you another two minutes. Okay. Two, two might just do it, you know. We get rolling, and uh, all you have to do is be over the line by six, Bill, and that's uh, then we'd be all right. Do you have any misgivings about going out when the track is so green? Well, it's bound to be a bit slower. It, when, the, when it rains here, it always is. You generally pick up a push, and that's been the problem we've been fighting all along anyway. But, uh, you know, I'll certainly give it a shot and take, take what we can get. Okay, keep your fingers crossed. Thank you, all right, Billy Alsop sweating it out. Jackie? Well, he still sits in his race car waiting for that big moment if it were ever to arrive. Just let's hope it, it does. It's still a little bit of time in hand. Sam, let's take a look at the field right now because it is a remarkable field. In pole position, as I said earlier, we've got Tio Fabi, 27 years of age, a rookie from Milan in Italy. And you can see that he achieved a speed of 207.395 miles an hour. Then Mike Mosley and then Rick Mears. Mears has been in trouble all month, Jackie, after getting off to a strong start. Uh, by contrast, however, Tom Sneva has done very well all month and is a real threat in the race. Well, of course, Al Unser Jr., a remarkable performance for a young rookie of 20 years of age, 202 miles an hour, he beat out the old man, and then Bobby Rahal making up that front row. On, uh, on row three, Al Unser Sr., a lot of experience there, a three-time winner of this race, sitting beside or behind his, his son. That's, that must be a big moment for any father. Well, I would think so. Imagine seeing your son ahead of you and to the right begin his first Indianapolis 500. Roger Mears, of course, will see his brother ahead of him and to the right, a full row in that case. But those brother and father and son combinations, kind of interesting. Tony Bettenhausen rounding out the third row. And then onto the fourth row, we have last year's winner, Gordon Johncock, another experienced driver beside him, Mario Andretti, and then a relatively new driver to the speedway over the last few years, Howdy Holmes at 199 miles an hour. And row five, we've got George Schneider, teammate to uh, A.J. Foyt in the same make of car, and Pancho Carter in the middle of that, with Bill Whittington down at 197 miles an hour. On the sixth row, we have Chip Canassi at 197, then, then an interesting man, a journalist, Patrick Bedard. Uh, he's going well, he's a rookie, and it's nice to see a motoring journalist competing. It is. I think it's a question of life imitating art, <laughs> because he became interested in writing first and, and, and racing because of that, and now he's actually racing. Well, the man is still racing is Joseli Garza from Mexico City in row six, making up that row. In row seven, you have Steve Chassis down there, another rookie at 195. Dick Simon, certainly a veteran of this race racetrack at 192. And Danny on Geis, a great favorite who crashed so heavily, a 202 speed, very successful in his attempt, but because of regulations had to be at a row seven position rather than further up as his speed would suggest. Kevin Cogan, who was the young man with the contro controversy last year at the head of row eight with Johnny Parsons in the middle of the row and the great A.J. Foyt running for his 26 Indianapolis 500 in row eight. On row nine, you have Chris Knievel, he, uh, Knievel rather, another rookie with Jeff Brabham, the son of Sir Jack Brabham, a three-time world champion race driver with Don Whittington filling out that row. On row 10, you've got Derek Daly, a young man from Dublin, a rookie, an ex-Grand Prix driver coming over to try his luck here. And lastly, in that row, Scott Brayton. And now in row 11, Steve Krisiloff, uh, Chet Phillip, who, as we know, is now the man on the bubble. Also, I think the only man in the race with a beard. <laughs> and lastly, Dennis Firestone, whose very dramatic run uh, we witnessed. And uh, Firestone, with road racing ability, was extremely lucky that he had that as he had to drive through a wet track in the last couple of turns. Well, these are the guys here that could easily be bumped. There's Chet Phillip there at 183, and that is a fragile time, we have to recognize. Steve Krisloff is a little more sure at 191 miles an hour. Dick Simon, a veteran, of course, at 192, and Mike Chandler up there at 94. I doubt very much whether Steve Chassis' or time of 195 miles an hour can be beaten today, frankly. I don't think there's enough time for that many people to get onto the racetrack. You can see it's live here. You can see the long shadows, as, of course, the afternoon is dragging on. It's 5.30. Uh, out here and it looks like being uh, a dry track in just a little while. Now, 
There's one man missing from that lineup. I'm sure a lot of fans must have recognized that already. And that, of course, is Johnny Rutherford, a man who's won three times in this great speedway, a, a man who's uh, a very successful driver indeed. Had a, a very serious accident here in this month of May, and we can look at that accident now and see the magnitude of the crash. The speeds here are enormous. Jackie, Johnny Rutherford was headed into turn three when a gust of wind blew his car slightly wide of the line. He fought for control and smashed very, very hard into the wall, sustaining extensive fractures to his right ankle and to his left foot. It was terrible pain for him. While you see him going along backwards along the wall there, he was already in great, great pain. Well, as ever, the rescue vehicles were on hand, but let's look at this once more in slow motion in the groove as he goes around there. That's the black area. The car begins to lose control right there. You can see the back end of the car coming out. And then, of course, he applies opposite lock, and there it goes. But he fights it really brilliantly, Jackie, here. And the fact that he makes so many minute movements of the wheel is able to carry him a little bit further down the track so the angle of incidence with the wall is not as bad as it might have been. Sam Posey visited Johnny Rutherford in hospital, and we will now take an opportunity to speak with Johnny after the accident. Johnny, first of all, how are you feeling? Well, uh, <clears throat> it's, been, it's been a little rugged. My, uh, my feet have given me a lot of pain, and uh, I'm not going to be tap dancing or roller skating anytime soon. <clears throat> but it's, it's getting better, just not as quick as I'd like for it to. The piece of driving that you did to minimize the actual impact against the wall is one of the most brilliant pieces of driving I've ever seen done in a racing car. What was going through your mind as you were struggling with the car? Oh, no. <laughs> in a nutshell. It's at this speed are really kind of a phenomenon because everything seems to, when you, when you lose it, or in the two that I've had now, when you lose it, everything seems to be slow-mo up until uh, up till that point. And then, bang, they suddenly gain incredible speed just before the impact, it seems like. And, I, you know, I don't know if that's just a mental process mm. or, or something, but it seems like they do kind of break off into slow-mo, you know, with the slide and whatever. And then, like my first one, the car did a, you know, did a uh, full spin and was coming around with a nose to the wall. Well, as I... You know, as the car was coming around, I looked over my shoulder for the wall and saw it. Everything was all right, and the nose was coming around, and then suddenly, bam, there was the wall. You know, it was like it just jumped over and grabbed me. Yeah. Johnny, you've had a, a distinguished career. You've won so many races, three Indianapolises. Have you thought now, possibly, in the last couple of days, ahead to the future? Is there any thought of retiring? No. No. No, no not yet, Sam. I've... Uh, I'm still strong enough and feel racy enough that uh, as soon as I get this mess cleared up and get things organized, we'll get into a test program with the car. And uh, How long do you think it'll be before you'll be driving again? I think uh, eight, ten weeks I'll be back out scraping around again. Good luck. Thank you. Well, that certainly is a, a relatively comfortable Johnny Rutherford at this point, but other drivers certainly have had their troubles. Bob Harkey had a bit of accident. This is an incident report, and you can see that he's still in some difficulty there. John Paul Jr., he's got his problems, but uh, he's been released on Friday, which was a good idea. He got out of hospital. Pete Halsmer, he uh, was released on Friday also, partially collapsed lung. He had a heavy incident. Jim Buick, no injuries at all. Checked in the hospital and allowed to go home. No problem there. Ken Schrader, well, he had no injuries either, but as ever checked in the field hospital here, a precaution always taken at Indianapolis. Doug uh, Havanagh, he got ankle injuries, and he's in a cast, of course. So therefore, you can see from there, there has certainly been problems at Indianapolis. Sitting next to me. Andre, this is a very special day in your life. Well, because it's my birthday. Yeah. <laughs> and can you have a better present than getting uh, the track dry and Bill out there to qualify? No, I would, I would, my, uh, the best present for me would be having Bill have a chance to qualify. Uh, I'd like to see him have another chance. And is it worth it, from a wife's standpoint, to sweat out all of last year like you did during the month of May and now all of this year and get it down to the last 25 minutes? Or... Well, it's, obviously it's worth it to Bill. 
um, I don't know that it's worth it to me. I don't really understand why he does do it, but it's terribly important to him. Will you be here on your next birthday, do you think, or will it be your plan to go somewhere else? I think next year we should do something I'd like to do. <laughs> I hope you get out on the track, the Alsop family. All right, back to you, Jackie. Well, where have I had those words before? I've had them for other racing drivers' wives, not to mention any name. Now, another man missing from uh, this field this year is a very famous name and part of a very famous family here at this 500. That is uh, Bobby Unser. Now, Bobby Unser's not in the field this year. And why? Well, we had an opportunity for Chris Akonabaki to speak to Bobby. Bobby, a big name in Indianapolis history. You're not in a car this year. Everyone wants to know <clears throat> what are you doing and how difficult it is for you not to be racing. <laughs> well, I'm really not having any difficulty by not doing it, Chris. I'm very happy that I made the decision that I did, that I quit driving the Indianapolis cars. And, and uh, what am I doing in place of it to keep Bobby happy? It's a couple of things. Number one, built the uh, stock car for my son, Robbie, to run in Albuquerque. And uh, number two, I've been trying to help out Patrick and his people. So that's kind of give me an easy way out. Now, well, I've really been quite happy. What about the change in your lifestyle? No big thing. It really hasn't changed. Uh, I'm working the endorsement field a lot harder. Endorsement business a lot harder than I have uh, the last probably four or five years. And so I'm just as busy as I've ever been any time in my life. So really not much has changed except I'm just not turning a steering wheel right now. The opportunity presented itself to drive again, might you? No, I may run some other racing, some other types. I haven't, uh, I definitely haven't retired from racing. I've just decided to retire from the Indianapolis stuff, cars. And, and the main reason is, is that it, it's just a full schedule deal if I was to do it. And I can't do that and do the other things like with my kids that I want to do. So that's really the main th decision. Given a choice. We're live here at Indianapolis. You can see the shadows are long, but nevertheless, the sun is out. And there's Bill Alsop still waiting. His helmet's been brought out now, which is, has, has to be an optimistic sign for him. He seems to still be nervous, nevertheless. Bill Alsop waiting for an opportunity to get into the 67th running of the Indianapolis 500. And I suppose that for him is one of the most important elements and probably the most important 20 minutes that he's going to face for quite some time. Now, last year, there was, of course, the big problem at the beginning of the race. Kevin Cogan, relatively new driver to Indianapolis, but nevertheless in a very competitive car on the front row of the grid with some great drivers alongside of them, perhaps the greatest of them all, A.J. Foyt. And we had a problem. Kevin Cogan ran into the side of A.J. Foyt and caused a great, big problem in the rest of the field. There was much criticism given to this young man at that time, and it's been going on ever since. Sam Posey had the opportunity of going out to California to meet with him and talk about that accident. As the cars accelerate to the start of the race, watch Kevin Cogan swerve, collide with A.J. Foyt, then ricochet into the path of Mario Andretti, thus triggering a chain reaction all through the field. Neither Kogan nor anyone else was seriously hurt, but the dust had barely settled when the accusations began to fly. A disgusted Mario Andretti shoved Kogan, then made it clear he thought the young driver, in his inexperience, had made a driving error. Next came an exchange with A.J. Foyt. For Kevin Kogan, Indianapolis 1982 was a black day. It's been almost a year now since the accident, but in that time, no clear-cut explanation of what happened has ever come to light. We're here in the home of Kevin Cogan, who was the central figure in that incident. Kevin, set the scene for us, if you would. Uh, what happened was the right rear CV joint broke, which basically connects the gearbox, the powertrain, to the wheels, rudely speaking. And what happens is anytime something breaks in there on one side or the other, uh, because it's a solid rear end, both wheels are, are being powered. Uh, when one isn't, then you only have power going to one side of the car, which forces the car one way or the other. All right, now we have a monitor set up here. I'd like to have you have a look at that scene again. Okay, we're coming out of turn four, just starting to accelerate from a little bit of a slow pace, getting into second gear and accelerating. And as we come down, the part breaks here, and then it pushes the car to the right, the right CV joint let go, 
making the front of the car go to the right. And if you see in this angle here, watch the front of the car, and you'll see it actually sliding over to the right. It's a very good angle for that. And right here, as the part breaks, watch the front go to the right. Just like if you were turning to the right. And after I crean off the Foyt in front of Andretti, he actually uh, made the accident a lot less severe than it could have been. I could have uh, hit that inside wall much harder. Why didn't you come forward at that point with this explanation? Well, the reason why is actually something I can't answer personally, because if it was up to me, uh, I would have had a full explanation immediately. You know, as soon as we inspected the car, I wanted to make sure we checked the car over and everything like that. I was being very cautious. I didn't want to say anything uh, just off the top of my head, just to throw off anybody. So I was very careful to say, okay, let's look at the car, make sure before we say anything, and then we'll go to the press. Well, we went to look at the car, check it over, and it was basically what I had just described, and uh, it was decided not to say anything, which I thought was a mistake. Who decided that? Uh, Roger Penske decided that. It's uh, pretty difficult to go back a year and determine what caused an accident at the start of the race. Uh, it's unfortunate. I know Kevin has felt bad about this. Uh, he probably feels that was one of the reasons that he isn't driving for us this year. But when you look at what happened, we had an accident the first lap. Uh, those cars were run all season long with the same pieces on them. We didn't have that type of failure. And I hope it was that, because if that's the way he felt it is, that's probably what happened. And I think he's a great guy. In fact, I talked to Dan Cotter uh, about Kevin, and I said he did a good job for us. But when I had an opportunity at the end of the year to pick Al Unzer, who was a good road racer and had won three Indy 500s, I really didn't have any choice. Jackie, you were one of the first people to talk to Kevin back in the garage after the accident. What did he have to say to you then? He was very confused. He'd had a lot of static from a lot of other drivers. He, when I walked in, he asked me if I had seen the accident. I said yes. He said, did AG hit me? That was his first uh, question, which was one of confusion, obviously. And I said, no, but did something break in the car? And at that very moment, he picked up on that very abruptly in the hope that I think that there may be something in that. Now, whether something broke or not, I guess we'll never know. But he was grasping at straws at that time. Well, exactly. We may never know what happened there. But one thing is for sure. The career of a young driver at Indianapolis was altered irrevocably by what did happen. Well, he has recovered. We've recovered also, and we'll be back at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway in a minute. Imagine winning the... So you can see that there's less than uh, 11 minutes, 10 and a half minutes to go before the end of qualifying today. You can see the trucks are still out on the racetrack. The track is still damp in places. Whether it will dry out is another thing altogether. A.J. Foyt, who qualified at 199 miles an hour in very difficult circumstances yesterday. He had a lot in his mind at A.J. Foyt, a great professional, the man who did the job accordingly and got himself into this 500-mile race. But sadly, A.J. Foyt had to race off from the speedway very quickly because his father, Tony Foyt, a man who's known from this speedway for so many years, passed away last night. ABC offer to the family Foyt our deepest sympathy. We'll be coming back for more coverage of this final hour at ABC in just a few moments. Hopefully the track will get dry. This is Bill Fleming. I'm with Tom Binford, the chief steward, and so let's get it right from him. Tom, you just leaned over and said a word to Bill Alsop. What'd you say to him? I told Bill it looked like there was no way it could be dry. Um, the problem areas in the first turn going into it in the front straightaway and coming out at two. It's still wet. We've got seven or eight minutes, and I told him just sit there if, if he liked. Uh, some, you never know when miracle might happen, but it certainly looks like it's a 98% chance we will not get started by six. You yourself have been out there. You must have made 20 circuits in that safety car. Oh, yes. We've been out there looking at ourselves and getting out and tasting it and everything else. But it, what we'd like to do is jack the track up and turn it around and let that sun go on the front stretch in the first turn, but some things you can't do. They have had the, the track dryers out there, and we've had trucks out there. We've done everything for Bill that we would do if there were 20 of them waiting to go out. But uh, Well, Tom, so keep, it, to keep it good a week from today, will you? Promise the sun will shine. We'll, do our best. <laughs> we'll be back with more of the final hour. There'll be the final minutes in a moment. 
So we have six minutes to go here at Indianapolis. We're live, but we can now look back at the pole position holder yesterday, Tio Fabi, 27 years of age. It's his second lap. He comes from Milan in Italy. He had already done a speed of 207.273 in his previous lap. This is a hot one. Jackie, in setting this lap record and getting pole position, Fabi becomes the only European since World War II, except for Jimmy Clark, ever to sit on the pole here. Quite an historic achievement, and he does it with a combination of the most unflappably smooth drive. I think you see him there, never seemingly to uh, alter the angle of the steering wheel, but just to coax the car smoothly through the turns, a real virtuoso performance. Well, that's the kind of performance it takes to get you in the pole at Indianapolis. I certainly think it's a, a remarkable achievement. And that, what you just watched there, was the fastest lap ever recorded officially at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, a time of 208.049 miles an hour. A remarkable performance by a rookie to come here with a car that obviously handles well. He is a happy man. So that is what happened to Tio Fabi. The rest of the front row is Mike Mosley, a very American American at 206 miles an hour. And then you've got Rick Mears making up that front row. Bill Alsop still waits, a little more serious than he was. A little, uh, a little smile in his eyes, nevertheless. A sad moment for him because it means that he will not be able to attempt to get into this 33 car field for the 67th running of the Indianapolis 500. We have a very full field for all 30 three cars. We've got a record average speed for the entire field at more than 198 miles an hour. Sam, it looks like a, a tremendous program we've got ahead of is next Sunday night. I can hardly wait for it. I think it's going to be a sensational race, uh, fastest field ever, and also a very big speed differential between the fastest and slowest cars. Well, we look forward to seeing you here in ABC on, on Sunday night. <laughs> The executive producer of ABC Sports is Rune Arlich. Today's show produced by Bob Goodrich. Directed by Roger Goodman. Technical director, Werner Gunther. Associate producer, Ben Harvey. Associate directors, Ned Simon and John Bassoni. The Indianapolis 500 time trials, the final hour, has been brought to you by Goodyear, makers of Eagle High Performance Radios. Be sure to be with us next Sunday, one week from today, for the 67th Indianapolis 500, 9 o'clock Eastern, 8 o'clock Central. Up, as always, 33 cars in 11 rows of three. The field this year has greater depth of talent and faster average speed than ever before. When he came here as a rookie this year, Teo Fabi was Teo Who to the average sports fan. Racing people knew that the 27-year-old Italian had experience in Formula One and sports car racing, but even they have been stunned by his performance. In becoming only the second rookie ever to win the pole position, Fabi also broke the one and four lap qualifying records. He's full of confidence. No, my car is just fantastic. The engine is fantastic, so it's uh, easy. I think any driver can do this on my car. The front row tomorrow, then, features a rookie, Fabi, a hungry veteran, Mike Mosley, and Rick Mears, who lost by the week of an eye last year and now returns as the pre-race favorite. The defending champion, Gordon Johncock, can be found on the inside of the fourth row. Next to him will be the hard luck winner of this race 14 years ago, Mario Andretti. Four rows further back, the only four-time winner, A.J. Foyt. For the first time, a father and son will race against each other at Indy. Al Unser Jr. will compete with his father on Al Unser Sr.'s 44th birthday tomorrow. One familiar face will be missing from the lineup. Three-time champion Johnny Rutherford had a terrible month here. This crash in practice finally did him in for 1983. With a broken ankle and a broken foot, Rutherford went on the injured list and pointed out again how real are the dangers of Indy. Well, it all comes together tomorrow before a crowd of some 400,000 on the scene and you watching at home. Our exclusive same-day coverage begins at 9 p.m. Eastern and Pacific, 8 Central. So make plans to be with us for a long and exciting evening. It will be blacked out, by the way, in the Indianapolis area. More of the U.S. USSR gymnastics competition after this message. <laughs>